from Philharmonic Hall in Lincoln Center, home of the world's greatest musical events. Another program in the award-winning series, the New York Philharmonic Young People's Concerts, under the musical direction of Leonard Bernstein. And here is Mr. Bernstein. Well, it's wonderful to be back with you again after what I hope was a nice restful summer vacation. And since you're all looking so bright and ready to work, I've picked a real hard subject for this opening program. We're going to dig into that terrifying old thing called sonata form. I've avoided this subject for years, not so much because it's difficult, but because so many words have already been spilled about it in so many music appreciation classes, where sonata form often winds up sounding like a road map with a lot of strange names like exposition and recapitulation and whatnot. But I hope that by the end of today's session, the idea of the word sonata is going to have much more meaning for you than that. And here's the way we're going to do it. We're going to start out by playing for you the first movement of Mozart's great symphony in C major, the last symphony he ever know, wrote, which is known as the Jupiter Symphony. Now, I'm not going to tell you anything about it in advance. We'll just play it for your pleasure. And then at the very end of the program, we'll play it for you again. And by that time, I hope you'll be hearing it with new ears. But you're probably wondering why we're playing a symphony on a program which is about sonatas. Well, the answer to that one is easy. A symphony is a sonata. You see, a sonata is a piece, usually in several movements, that has a certain basic musical form. And when that form is used in a piece for a solo instrument, like a violin or a flute, or a solo instrument with piano accompaniment, the piece is called a sonata. Now, when the same form is used in a piece for three instruments, it's called a trio. And for four instruments, it's called a quartet, and for five, a quintet, and so on. But when this form is used in a piece for a full orchestra, it's called a symphony. Simple. A symphony is merely a sonata for orchestra. Now, that's all I'm going to tell you for the moment. Now let's just sit back and enjoy this glorious first movement of Mozart's Jupiter Symphony.
Uh, now that we have had the pure pleasure of listening to that divine Mozart, let's get to work and find out why that music gives us such pleasure. And the thing that interests us most today about it 
is its form, the musical shape of the piece. Now, you know, the shape of a musical composition is the hardest thing for most people to grasp. They can remember a tune or a rhythm easily enough, even harmonies and counterpoints, but the form is harder to understand because grasping the form of a piece means seeing it all at once, or I should say hearing it all at once, which is, of course, impossible since music takes place in time instead of in space. So how can you hear it all at once? You see, you can see the form of a painting, for instance, or a church, more or less all at once, because their forms exist in space. When you look at this stage, for instance, you see its whole form instantly, and you can take pleasure in its proportions and its balances. But with a piece of music, it takes time to hear the form. You have to keep in your head all the notes you've already heard while you're listening to the new ones so that by the time the piece is over, it all adds up to one continuous form. Now, maybe that sounds impossible, but it's not. Of course, it's not easy either. But if you know a little about the form in advance, for instance, if you know the piece is going to be in sonata form, then it all becomes much easier because you can almost predict what musical shapes are going to happen. And that's what we're going to do now by finding out what a sonata is. Now, this word sonata originally meant simply a piece of music. It comes from the Latin word sonare, to sound. So a sonata is anything that is sounded by instruments as opposed to a cantata, which is anything that is sung, from the Latin word cantare, to sing. But it's only in the last 200 years or so that the word sonata has acquired a special meaning which describes the form of a piece, and in particular, the first movement of a piece. And this first movement form, which is known as sonata form, laid the foundations of the symphony as we have known it from that time, almost 200 years ago, right on into our own 20th century. Now, how can we explain this immense popularity and growth of sonata form over 200 years? What makes it so satisfying and so complete? Well, two things, really. First, it's perfect three-part balance. Remember that. And second, the excitement of its contrasting elements, balance and contrast. In those two words, we have the main secrets of sonata form. Now, first, let's consider that three-part design I talked about. This is something we can see all around us. If you think of a bridge with two great towers rising on either side of a river and the connecting span sweeping over the water between them, that's a three-part form. One, two, three. Or think of an elm tree with its central trunk and the umbrella-shaped branches arching out on both sides. That's another three-part structure. One, two, three. Or the three-part balance of a human face with its centerpiece of nose and mouth and its two mirror-like side pieces of eyes and ears. Again, three-part form. One, two, three. Now, of course, any form as basic and natural as that in life must be just as natural in music, and so it is. The most basic form of a simple song is usually a three-part form. Take the old nursery tune that we all know as Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, for instance. There's a first part, which we'll call A. That's A. Then comes a middle part, which we'll call B. And finally, we return to the first part, A, again. And the song is over. Now, that's a clear, exact three-part form, A, B, A. Now let's see how this simple little construction grows in size when it's used in a slightly larger song form, say, a modern popular song. Now, in fact, most pop tunes stick to this ABA pattern very strictly. The only difference here, and this is important as you'll see later, is that usually the first A section is repeated right away before the B section comes so that the pattern is really AABA instead of just ABA. But it's still made out of those same three parts, ABA, only the first part is played twice in a row. That's not hard. Uh, let's take a, a pop tune. In fact, let's take a typical Beatles tune and see what happens. Uh, here, first, there's an A section. 
I give her all my love. That's all I do. And if you saw my love, you'd love her too. I love her. That's A, all right? That's what's. Now, now what happens? That A section is repeated exactly the same. She gives me everything and tenderly and so on right down to and I love her. That's the end of the repeated A section, right? Right. Now comes the contrasting B section. A love like ours could never die. I think that's how it goes. As long as I have you near me. That's the B. And that brings us back again to the original A section in all its glory. Bright are the stars that shine, dark is the night, and so on right to the end of the piece. Well, that... <laughs> that... That represents a small step forward from Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. It's small, but it's a step because it's grown in size and it has that extra deluxe feature, the repeat of the first A section, which Twinkle Twinkle does not have. Now, let's follow the growth of a three-part song even farther as it expands into a big operatic aria. For example, the famous aria from Carmen that is sung by the other woman of the opera, Michaela. Now, this is a little more sophisticated, let's say. It doesn't break up quite so neatly into an exact ABA, but I'm sure you'll be able to follow its three parts just as easily as the Beatles song. There's a sweet lyrical first part and a more excited dramatic middle part, and then the return again to the quiet first part. And here to sing it for us is Miss Veronica Tyler, who made her television debut on one of our young performers concerts just a few years ago. We're delighted to have her back with us again, singing Michaela's aria from Carmen. Je vais voir le prix Les artifices et les folies Ont fini
Now that we've, uh, now that we've learned to recognize a three-part song form, which I'm sure we have, I think we're ready to take the plunge into sonata form itself, because a typical sonata movement is really only a more expanded version of a three-part song form, even to the balancing of its two A sections on either side of the central B section. And here's where those nasty roadmap names come in. I'm sorry, but they have to. The first part, or A section, is called the exposition. And this is where the themes of the movement are stated for the first time, or exposed, if you will, therefore the word exposition. This is then followed by the B section, in which one or some or all of those themes are developed in different ways. And so it is called the development section. And finally, just as you expected, we get the A section stated again. And this third part is usually called, watch out, the recapitulation. Now that's a tough one, and actually I'm not too crazy about these terms either, but what can we do? We have to use the words that are most commonly used in order to be understood, so I guess we're stuck with those words exposition, development, and recapitulation for our ABA. But whatever words we use, the idea of those three parts is still clear and simple. That feeling of balance we get from two similar sections, A and A, situated on either side of the central development section, just as the ears are situated in balancing positions toward the nose. But you remember I said that there were two main secrets to the sonata. There's balance and contrast. And this idea of contrast is just as important as the other idea of balance, because it's what gives the sonata its drama and its excitement. Now, how does this contrast take place? I'll show you, and here I'm going to have to get a little technical for a minute or two, but I'm sure you won't mind that, because what I'm going to show you now is very important. In fact, this is the root of the whole sonata business, and that is the sense of key or tonality. Now, most music that we hear is written in one key or another. Not so much concert music that's written these days, but most of the music you're likely to hear is in a key. Now, for instance, the Beatles song we played before is in this key, and I love her. That's F major, but it could also be in G major, and I love her, or it could be in C major, oh, and I love her, or in any of 12 other different major keys. Not 12 other, 12 in all. But whatever key it's in, let's say C major, you feel a keynote, a center, or a home plate, where the music belongs. It starts out from there and gets back to there. And that home plate center is called the tonic. And the tonic note is the first note of that scale. And the tonic chord is the chord you build on top of that note. That's it. Now, all the other notes of the scale also have names, but I won't bother you with them, except for this one, which I'd like you to remember, the dominant. That's the name given to the fifth note of any scale. One, two, three, four, five. In this key of C major, the fifth note happens to be G. And the dominant chord is the chord that's built on that note. That's the dominant. Now comes the main event, how these two key centers, the tonic and the dominant, relate to each other. If I play a tonic and a dominant chord in that order, what do you feel? Something is left unfinished, unresolved, isn't it? You feel a desperate urge to get back to the tonic where you started, don't you? Okay, let's play those two chords in their reverse order, dominant and then tonic. Now you feel satisfied, don't you? So you see, that tonic is like a magnet. You can pull away from it, going to all kinds of other chords, other keys, other tonal centers, but in the end, the tonic always pulls you back. And out of this magnetic pull, away from and back to the tonic, classical sonata form is built. That's where the drama lies, the tension, in the contrast of keys with one another. Now let's see how this works in an actual piece of music by Mozart. The composer will naturally begin his sonata in the key of the tonic, and his opening theme will be in that key, as in this famous C major sonata by Mozart. 
Here's the main theme. But now, like a magician, he begins to lure us away from the tonic to a new key, to the dominant. dominant in G major in a whole new key and in this new key Mozart gives us a new theme his second theme which goes like this And then finally, still in this key of G major, he gives us a little fanfare-like tune with which he closes the exposition. So there we are, solidly established in the dominant key of G major, and the exposition part of this movement is over. Now, at this point in the classical sonata, we usually bump smack into a repeat sign, which means go back to the beginning, and play that whole A section or exposition that you've just heard all over again. It's just like the Beatles song. You remember A, A, B, A. You repeat that first section. And so for the second time, we hear the full exposition, first theme, second theme, and closing theme, starting in the tonic and winding up in the dominant. But there's no point in playing it all over again for you now. You've just heard it. So we'll go on to the next section. Now, actually, this whole exposition we just heard is like the first act of a drama, the drama of running away from home, of pulling away from that magnet we call the tonic. And now the next act coming up, which is the development, intensifies that drama, that wandering away even farther from home through even more distant keys, and then finally giving in and coming home in the third act or recapitulation. That's the drama of it all. So in the second part, our development section of this Mozart sonata, the composer lets his imagination roam free. The themes he has stated in the exposition wander around in one foreign key after another, like a trip around the world. Now, because this particular sonata of Mozart is such a short one, the development section is also very short. In fact, the only theme Mozart does develop is that little fanfare tune we just heard the closing theme of the exposition. But now in the development, he puts it through its paces like this. us back to the third and last section of this three-part sonata form, the recapitulation. And this is the moment when that magnet we were talking about finally wins out and draws us back home to the tonic. And the whole exposition is repeated or recapitulated. Only this time we must hear it all in the tonic key. Even the second theme and the closing theme, which we originally heard in the dominant, so that when the movement is over, we are safely at home in C major, where we began. Now, of course, Mozart, like all geniuses, is full of surprises. He doesn't always play the game according to the rules. In fact, he often gives us much more pleasure by breaking rules than by obeying them. And in this C major sonata of his, he does just that. Where the recapitulation should be in the tonic, in the key of C, Mozart holds out on us. He is still resisting that magnet of the tonic, C major, and instead he gives us the recapitulation in the unexpected key of F.
But now Mozart yields and the magnet wins out after all, and the rest of this little movement is all safe and warm back home in C major. Now, that, that wasn't terribly hard to follow, was it? It's terribly hard to play, but it sounds much easier than it is. But it's not very hard to follow the form. You see now what I mean by balance and contrast. The balance of the three-part form, the exposition, the development, and the recapitulation, and the contrast of the tonic with the dominant. Of course, there's much more to it than we can explain in this brief hour. The contrasting key is not always in the dominant. Rules get broken left and right. And then there's that whole business of introductions and codas, which means extra sections at the beginning and end of the movement. But you've got plenty of time to learn about those. What matters now is that you see the two main things, the magnetic effect of the tonic and the ABA form. And armed with only that information, you should be able to recognize and follow any classical sonata form movement. Now, just to see if I'm right, I'm going to throw you a curve and play for you the last movement of Prokofiev's Classical Symphony, which is a modern work, but a deliciously spoofing imitation of the 18th century classical sonata form. It has an exposition consisting of a first theme in the tonic, a second theme in the dominant, and a closing theme in the dominant, then that whole exposition is repeated exactly. Then there's a development section in which these themes are tossed around. And then finally, the recapitulation, which is the whole exposition again, only all in the tonic. It's a perfect example of sonata form at its simplest and clearest, A, B, A. See if you can follow it.
Now, I hope I was right in thinking that you were able to follow the form of that movement by Prokofiev. If I was wrong, you'll have another chance in a moment to try your luck. If I was right, then you're well on your way toward being a real music listener. Because as I said before, anyone can enjoy a tune or a rhythm. That's easy. But to enjoy the form of a piece of music is much harder. Then you have to be a real music listener. But a real music listener can see or hear the form of a piece just as clearly as a person can see the form of a bridge. Now, confident that you are all new experts on the subject of sonata form, we are going to keep our promise and play for you again the opening movement of the Jupiter Symphony with which we began this program, that uh, great C major symphony. Only this time, because this movement is so much more expanded, uh, fully developed and elaborate than the movements we've been listening to, we have decided to enlist the aid of uh, these nine young students from the Manus College of Music uh, who are holding up blank signs at the moment. Now, uh, what they're going to do is as the music unreels itself and each new section comes up, these nine charming youngsters who, have, as you can see, have formed for you a very clear three-part form already are going to announce each section in turn by turning the sign around. And if any of you still have doubts about the sonata form, these sign bearers should clear them up for you. The only other thing I have to tell you about before we play is that for reasons of time, we will not obey the repeat sign at the end of the exposition. So instead of being Beatles, A-A-B-A, -A -A, we're going to be just plain A-B-A. -A. Otherwise, you're on your own, and I hope you do indeed hear this piece now with new ears.
From Philharmonic Hall in Lincoln Center, the season's first New York Philharmonic Young People's Concert with Leonard Bernstein has presented a program titled, What is Sonata Form? Featuring movements from the Jupiter Symphony by Mozart, the Classical Symphony by Prokofiev, and Mikhaela's aria from Carmen with Veronica Tyler, soprano soloist. This program was recorded in Philharmonic Hall and produced and directed by Roger Englander.